Hello and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight or whenever you are watching this presentation. My name is Ann Bennett. I'm the executive director of the Laurel Historical Society. I'm also a professional archaeologist and you are joining us here in celebration not only of our current exhibit at the Laurel Museum. It's uh, it's all laurels, uh, city limits and beyond, but also in celebration of Maryland Archaeology Month. And I am joined by my co-presenter uh, and co-archaeologist on this project, Mary San Filippo. Hi, Mary. Hi. <laughs> Uh, she's been really uh, instrumental in helping us uh, with this project, and I'll go through and say a special thanks to some of our other helpers as we go through the presentation tonight. So again, I just wanted to thank everyone for attending tonight, and the goal is really to give everyone an update on the projects that we have done so far, and to see the next steps as we progress. So we've kind of ended our run in the field, and there is still much more archival and artifact analysis to do. So uh, just because we're out of the field doesn't mean that this is the end of the project, and it's uh, been very exciting to be part of it, but with there is still is much more to do. So we want to give you uh, an update on where we are and also involve you and invite you to become part of the project as well. This was great because we had such a great input uh, from the community, from our students to to our community volunteers. And we encourage you, if you're in the area or even if you are remote, that we do have additional volunteer opportunities. So if you uh, want to roll up your sleeves and work with the artifacts uh, in the lab with us, or if you want to do some remote archival or deed research, we'd be happy to have you. So I just wanted to uh, start uh, again with a brief history of Laurel for those of you, uh, as we saw in the chat, that live in Laurel or just live right down the street from the museum. Uh, this will be very familiar to you, but I'm hoping that you will also learn uh, a little more about the city in which you live uh, and just what's kind of just, uh, just around the corner from your house or from the museum. And if you are not in Laurel or if you're not uh, very familiar with the area. I hope you learn uh, a little bit about our history as well and see all the great information on uh, the stories that can come out when we start to explore the history of the area through history and archives and archaeology. And uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of background as well. So there has been archaeology done in Laurel before. This is certainly not the first attempt at it. Uh, there was a Laurel Archaeological Survey done in the 1970s. And if anyone on the call or recording uh, was involved with that, I would love to talk with you, especially if you have any field notes or artifacts or anything like that. Uh, please get in touch with me. There was also archaeology done at the museum building itself in the 90s before it opened as a museum. And then there's been uh, other um, opportunities as well, uh, privy excavation in the 400 block of Main Street, uh, Patuxent Place uh, down by the railroad. So there's been archaeology in Laurel before, uh, but this uh, is kind of uh, unique because it doesn't kind of function as the uh, traditional phased archaeological approach. So if you are familiar with how archaeology works, then you'll know that usually you go in and you investigate on, you know, very systematically doing uh, very controlled excavations, either on a grid uh, or on some planned map. And you have specific questions going into the research project based off of either, you know, a our existing maps or archival research you uh, that kind of dictate you know where you're going to dig and how you're going to dig and for us this project was a little bit different because it was really functioning more of a salvage archaeology project more so than a, a more typical phased excavation and the reason why this project came along in the first place and why it's so important, uh, and as you'll, as you'll see in the slides, is because these buildings and this lot that you see here in our overview picture uh, do not exist anymore. So this is on the back end of the St. Vincent Pilati High School campus. And as part of their uh, campus renovation, they are going to expand uh, and these buildings were torn down. So our goal 
was really to get in, uh, find out as much information about the houses, about the people that lived in the houses, and document as much as we can before everything was uh, demolished. But more importantly than just documenting what was there, we wanted to involve the students and turn this into a teaching exercise and make it uh, available to our summer camp students who are typically in grades five, six, and seven. Uh, and then we also started an archaeology club over at uh, Pilate High School, and they've been working with us uh, off and on since August of 2021 when we had our first summer camp over here. So uh, I just wanted to, you know, have that different mindset in that a lot of what we are doing aligns with best practices for archaeological investigations, but it doesn't uh, necessarily fall into that traditional phased approach of uh, archaeology phase one, phase two, and phase three. Uh, but we did have a lot of fun with the students that we worked with and the community members as well. So, Mary, did I leave anything out uh, that they should know about the project before we take a look at some of these maps? No, no, I don't think so. Okay, excellent. Uh, so let's... Um... Let's go on here. And what we're looking at now is obviously a Google aerial picture. And I just wanted to kind of orient you to the project area as well as give you a brief history in the background of Laurel. So what we're looking at really is the, the very kind of uh, northern parts of, of um Main Street kind of and the western part. So we're at the very far end of Main Street and at the top of your screen you should see that star. That's where the Laurel Historical Society is located at 817 Main Street. It's really uh, essentially at the corner of Main and 9th. And then if you go south that whole big block in the middle is mostly taken up with the Vincent Pilate High School, as well as the Community Center for St. Mary uh, Roman Catholic Church. Uh, but there's two little blocks of residential housing in the northwest corner, uh, just right across the street from the museum, as well as in uh, the southwest corner where you can see our project area outlined in brown. And then there's just a few other residence houses right at the very corner. And so the reason that this is so important is this is the historic heart of Laurel. This is where it all started with Laurel, Maryland. And Laurel, for those of you who don't know, is a factory town. It started in the early 1800s as the site of um, as a grist mill and expanded into a cotton mill before uh, it became uh, a bigger industrial operation with the Patuxent Manufacturing Company in the 1830s. And all of that took place just off my screenshots uh, right across from the museum across 9th Street where the community pool is located now. So the Laurel Cotton Mill and its huge operations were all located in that area. And from there, that industrial uh, mindset and all of the housing, all of the support buildings grew out from it. So the museum building is a uh, mid 19th century tenant house. All of those houses that you see along the north side of Main Street, uh, most of those are tenant housing as well. Some are still rental properties, other has been turned into uh, single family or duplex. And there are um, other uh, tenant housing as you move up Ninth Street as well. And in this historic block, we also see additional structures that would have been located to support uh, the mill. So, and we'll see this on the maps in just a few minutes. So we have uh, in kind of the northeast corner of that block, we have we would have seen Assembly Hall, which was kind of like a social building, a social gathering place for the mill workers. Uh, and it survives part partially, not necessarily in structure, but in name, uh, because there's um, uh, Assembly Street kind of going behind uh, the Keesler Parish Center there. Uh, and then really where the, the heart of Pilate High School is, uh, was the location of the superintendent's residence. And this was a very fine, um, you know, mansion building that housed the superintendent that was in charge of the Laurel Cotton Mill. Uh, and it was turned into an academy uh, over the years uh, before being completely demolished uh, in the late 1950s, I believe, uh, before this current building uh, was constructed for the high school. 
And then you can see uh, it, it expanded out and there's different parking lots and, and different additions to the high school complex. Um, so that's why we're so excited to investigate this project area because it is tied so closely to that early mill history of Laurel. Uh, and really, you know, if you're going to talk about Laurel history, again, this is where it started. This is really the historic heart of Laurel. And so we're going to be talking about all of these things as we go through our talk tonight. And if I advance the slide just real quick, same picture, just a smaller screenshot here, and you can see that's where those uh, two existing houses were in that overview picture. We have a single uh, family white frame structure, which is where the little uh, red dot is at 229th Street. Uh, and then there is a brick duplex right next to it. So that's 224 and 222. And then that empty lot, which is empty now, would have been another duplex identical to that brick building. Uh, and so that's 226 and 228. Is that right, Mary? Yes. Right. So, uh, so that was uh, so that was demolished sometime after the 1950s, uh, and all of this property is owned in some way, shape, or form uh, uh, by Pilati uh, or the administration. So again, uh, if you've got questions, let us know. But this is, we're going to kind of take you through uh, the whole experience, again, of how this project came about and uh, what we hope to, to gain from it still. So when we kind of first proposed the project, it was kind of a win-win. So uh, we had already had... Um, what, two summer camps under our belts. The first one was at the Laurel Museum in 2019. The second was kind of virtual <laughs> during COVID in 2020. And then we returned to on-site excavations in 2021. And we're like, well, let's find someplace new to dig, especially if we have repeat campers. So uh, this kind of fell into place very nicely because at that time it had been scheduled for demolition. Uh, we weren't quite sure when that demolition would take place, but we were like, this is a perfect opportunity. And so I approached the administration at uh, Pilate High School. They gave us permission to be there uh, and to really just, you know, find out as much information as we could. And so one of the places that I started was by doing a, a real property database search. Uh, and this is a, a free service. You can, if you live in Maryland, you can just go to the, the website, uh, look up public information about your house and uh, it'll kind of give you some information and so it did give us information but we're not quite sure <laughs> how accurate it is and Mary's laughing uh, but we'll get into that in a little bit so we looked at again 220 which is the single family home 222 and then 226 is uh, the really the big blocks, the, the, the properties. And so for both of them, it came up as either originally being constructed in 1920 or 1930. And so we're like, okay, so that's a little, little recent in time. It's still about 100 years old, so it, it's still a historic property. It gives you information about square footage, about grading. It's again, it's not super accurate because we did encounter some basement areas, but they're not finished. Um, so it, it gives you some information, but as we learned, we have to take this with a grain of salt, which we, we don't always necessarily have to, to have to do with this. So these are the two standing structures. And then this is the third structure. So it, it, it's not, um, uh, again, it's not a, a structure anymore, um, but it's referring to the the 226 is now technically the address for that concrete art building, essentially, uh, in the back of the property. Um, but again, that block, that plot is, is owned by the administration over at Pilates. So we can, so again, we, we have some deed references and legal uh, descriptions of the property. And so this was our first start. So we're like, oh, Great. Okay, we have it. 1920, 1930. We got a good solid uh, start on this, uh, and then we started doing some map research. And so this is where I, our, our first. This is where we first start to get confused. Mary, what are you gonna say? Actually, um, just looking at the buildings from an architectural standpoint, 220, the white building, is Greek Revival, which became popular in the 1840s and continued on into the 1860s. 
The brick is an Italian eight structure, which became popular in the 1860s and carried on until turn of the century, give or take. So I was very confused when you first showed me those dates. Yeah, uh, again, you know, you know, there's a difference between, you know, kind of cutting edge, you know, residence and architecture and then kind of what trickles down to the vernacular. Um, and then the fact that it it's really tenant housing versus, you know, kind of single family. Um, so, yeah, there was there's some questions right off off the bat just you know just by looking at it and uh so again this is these are the pictures that that Mary's referring to so again we can kind of see a frontal view of uh the the two uh existing buildings so the single family on the left the duplex on the right uh so you can kind of see some of those architectural elements that Mary mentioned uh and then you can also see it repeated this is part of the um uh, Maryland Inventory for Historic Places, they did a survey of the different historic districts in Laurel, uh, which has seven different historic districts. Uh, so this is kind of the Montgomery uh, side of the Laurel Historic District. Uh, so they were both documented in that survey, and they put the dates a little earlier, which is interesting and good, but still not exactly what we would think, you know, given what Mary had just said. So we started thinking one was 1920 and not 1930. Now we're pushing it back. Uh, we have a little uh, more description in terms of the architectural styles. Uh, so the so this is what uh, we were kind of refining. So this is what we're expecting. Okay, it's a little closer to the turn of the century. Okay. Uh, and so then we start looking at maps. So I want to kind of go through the earlier maps uh, just very quickly because they're not as detailed as, as what we see uh, in future uh, in future maps. Um, so what we're looking at again, the the star is roughly where the Laurel Museum is, and again the the triangle or rectangle, sorry, <laughs> is roughly where the project area is. The main uh, landmarks here are going to be Main Street and then the Patuxent River. You can see some of the big names associated with the history of the Laurel Cotton Mill, uh, George Tiffany and Company. You can see them uh, in, in different places. You can see uh, Heath uh, as well and the Avondale Mill uh, further down along the Patuxent. Uh, so you can see some really big uh, Laurel names here as well. Uh, you can see the Catholic Church. So St. Mary's was uh, constructed starting in 1843. So it was one of the early Catholic churches or sorry, the early churches in Laurel. Uh, and so we can kind of orient that. So it's across 8th Street and then we have the block of land uh, across from that where the mill superintendent housing would have been. Uh, and then I mentioned the assembly hall or the social hall. Uh, you can see where it says assembly room. So we're kind of, you know, honing in on this far uh, western part of Main Street. Uh, and I'll bring this in in detail in just a little bit, but we fast forward to 1878 uh, and we have much more detail, uh, which is great. And we can also see how much Laurel has grown in, uh, you know, a little over 15 years. And so we can see that the mill is, is definitely expanding. Uh, this is after its rebuild, uh, after the fire, uh, that Laurel itself is, you know, the, the properties are, are drifting south now. We have incredible uh, amounts of detail that this is telling us. Excuse me. Uh, so now this is really the, the earliest map that we have significant detail for our project area. Again, the star is going to be the Laurel Museum. Uh, and then you can see much more detail on the, the Laurel Mill operations. And in that big project area, remember that big aerial shot where most of Pilate High School is taking up most of that block now, we can see that it was in the early decades, essentially two different properties. So it was the property of the Laurel Mill, where again, the superintendent lived at this time. It's General George Nye. And he is listed on there as the occupant. Uh, and then we have William Warfield owning kind of the southern uh, portion of that block. Uh, and so we can see the, the project area in approximately uh, that southwest corner uh, of 9th um, and Montgomery. And I just wanted to pop in with a question real quick. Uh, so the definition of, of tenant that I'm using is, you know, somebody that doesn't 
own the building that they are living in. Uh, and for our purposes, we're almost definitely associated and worked at uh, the Laurel Cotton Mills, uh, especially in uh, the early parts, uh, and I should say mostly throughout the 19th century. Uh, as we get into the 20th century, we know that there were residents not associated with the Cotton Mill, and then really by the, the 1920s uh, into the 30s and 40s, the, the mill has closed operation and the buildings have been demolished. So uh, it still represents uh, basically you know, tenants or, or renters uh, that we would associate uh, with, you know, people that are just renting the space but not owning the actual structure. Uh, okay, so we're going to blast through these maps. Again, thank you for your questions. If you have any others, please let us know. And Mary, if I leave anything out, uh, definitely jump in. Um, and so this was, this is a, just real quick, because again, it doesn't give great detail, but this is uh, one of the earliest USGS uh, quad maps that we have of the area. So roughly, you know, we're on the north side of Main Street is where uh, the museum is, and then a block south uh, along Montgomery Street is where our project area is. And so we can, again, you know, see growth and development. The railroad has come through, that kind of thing. And we can see a little bit of the topography as well uh, along the river. Um, this is really interesting as well. This is a copy uh, of uh, a survey map uh, done in 1890. And this is in uh, the collection of the Laurel Historical Society. So if you come to our uh, John Brennan Reading Library, you'll get to see a copy of this in our collection. Uh, but it's not uh, detailed. So it's not capturing information on the buildings. It's really more of a plat map. It shows where the lots are. Uh, and so you, we can kind of see that this is, the, again, the project areas that some Southern portion of that big block. We see Assembly Street still named. It's going all the way through between 9th and 8th, which it doesn't currently. Uh, and then this copy is not great, but you can see that there's a little bit of uh, white dots, uh, and that's actually the border. Um, so it, it actually is dividing that block into two plots. Uh, it just doesn't reproduce very well on that. Uh, and other than that, there's not great detail. Again, it's more just where the lots are located in Laurel. You do still call out specific structures like the St. Mary's Roman Catholic Church, and then the public school uh, diagonal across from our project area. And then here's when it gets interesting. So I'm going to let Mary talk about this in a little bit. Um, but I just wanted to again to orient you to this. And Mary, I'm going to let you tell them what uh, the Sanborn maps are uh, and what's so important about this. But I just again want to call your attention to the Laurel Museum buildings and the star and our project area with three buildings is now uh, in that round square in the bottom. Um, but Mary, what are we looking at and, and why are all these uh, different colors on our map? Okay, the Sanborn uh, maps were actually fire insurance maps. They were used by the fire department and also by insurance companies. The different colors denote what the material of the structures were. They also will have little numbers to tell you whether it was one, two, or multiple story. X's on the yellow buildings are stables. So again, then they would realize that there would be livestock they would need to look for. These were kind of ways for the fire department to know what they were going to be battling against and insurance companies to know how they're going to pay for it when they had to pay back the money for the buildings burning down. And they are an amazing resource for archaeologists because the the level of detail involved. But again, note this is 1897, long before these buildings are supposed to exist. Yes, thank you, Mary. So this is a detail. So that's just drilling down into our project area from the bigger map. And this is great because a lot of these are publicly accessible. The Laurel Historical Society does have original Sanborn maps in its collection, but you can get them online from the Library of Congress. And so it's really great information. Like Mary said, not only do we have specific information about where the buildings are, as opposed to that earlier map that just showed the plot, we don't have information about where things are. We get to know the types of materials and the stories. Are they one story? Are they two stories? Are they one and a half stories? Uh, so this is our project area. And like Mary said, 
these buildings, according to both surveys, weren't supposed to exist. <laughs> uh, so sometime um, in the 1890s, uh, we think, you know, these structures uh, were built, or at least they, you know, were the earliest recorded uh, map that shows their presence. So we see the, the yellow structure is the white frame one. It's a little closer to Ninth Street, and the, the two duplexes in yellow are pretty much identical. They're in the same area. They're just, uh, you know, separated from each other. And, you know, for our purposes, these were kind of guiding uh, where we would kind of excavate. And I said we didn't really go in with specific research questions as much as we just wanted to go in with the mindset that these buildings are not going to be around much longer. Let's get out what we can uh, and just go from there. But what was really guiding us was there's those tantalizing little yellow outbuildings in the backyard, which are going to be the outhouses or the privies or some out supporting out structure. Uh, and so that's really where the goodies are. This is uh, what archaeologists want to see because those are going to represent uh, trash pits or privies or uh, just areas where there's going to be a lot of artifacts associated with the people that lived in these buildings. Also, one thing as you're going through the maps, pay attention to the red brick buildings. Uh, you will notice when they put on the front and back porches. So you will see changes through time that uh, denote you know, the, the different things as the buildings evolved. Yes, perfect. Thank you. And that's a good point. So the little yellow on it, that's going to be like a wooden porch, uh, essentially on, on the front of the house is what we see here. Uh, so again, I love maps. I used to teach cultural geography, so I'm going to get really <laughs> uh, carried away with the maps if I'm not careful. So uh, we'll kind of speed it up in time. So the next set of maps that we have, again, these are the Sanborn maps, forward in time about a decade. So we have 1903 and then 1908. Uh, they are virtually identical to each other, but we see some important uh, additions come in from the 1897. So there's some more outbuildings going on just outside of our project area. We have the addition of a long um, one-story outbuilding behind the, the single family home. And we have an addition of um, a supporting structure, a second privy, <laughs> something going on uh, in the back of our middle uh, structure there. And then like Mary said, now we have the introduction of back porches or back patios, uh, some sort of wooden structure on the back of the houses. So those are the really the significant uh, additions to the structures and to our project area uh, on these two maps. Uh, and then again, just kind of going chronologically, uh, we don't see again a lot of detail in our project area, but we can we can still see you know the Roman Catholic Church is is denoted. We can see some of the the big structures like the Warfield House or the Mill Building, uh, but there's nothing really specific uh, in our project area. Uh, and so we come to the 1914 Sanborn maps. This one has a little special place in my heart because this is one of the original ones we have in our collection. And uh, about a year and a half ago, we had it digitized. So it is now, uh, you know, much uh, better and accessible uh, part of our online digitized collection. So uh, we can we can see that there's not a, a lot of difference in our project area. We still have kind of that long outbuilding. We have the adjacent privy. We got that other outbuilding hanging on the third lot here. Uh, but Mary, we have your favorite mystery building uh, popping up. Do you want to point that out real quick? You mean the one next door or? Yeah, so there's this long single story shed or something on fronting Ninth Street that we can't quite figure out what it is or why it was there. Um, yeah, we and, see and, all the other buildings are stables because you see the X on them and other little buildings associated with that. But this long, skinny building along Ninth Street just has me completely puzzled. Because again, it's it's right there on the street. It's not set back from the road. You can see all the other houses, all the other public buildings are set back, but it is right smack there on Ninth yeah. Street. 
And the same thing, uh, I'll get to it. So there's an 1823 Sanborn map as well, uh, but I just wanna point out that Mary did some deed research for us as well. And we can see uh, some family names, the specific um, survey information here. Did you wanna say anything about this, Mary? Do you want us to go on to the next map? Actually, I just noticed the, uh, it does say Whitehead on there for the farmhouse, the white one at 220. And they did own the property for uh, from like 1920 on through, I think it's almost to the 1970s. So that okay, was the one family that yeah. kind of stuck it out. The others changed considerably. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that sounds, that's right. And Whitehead's a pretty big name in, in Laurel as well. Um, so then I just wanted to again point out, so the same year that deed map was written, we have an 1823 Sanborn map, that structure shed thing is gone, <laughs> it's, it was only there for about a decade or so, uh, and then the 1931 Sanborn map that you found, Mary, uh, again, kind of has, um, you know, kind of, kind of same overall structure, uh, there's, you know, some additional outbuildings that are, um, still around but overall the footprints of the buildings uh has not changed and you notice on the 23 you've now lost the uh privies the privy buildings in the backyards of the two brick structures are now gone right and then we had a chance to go into both uh houses before they were demolished and so we did see uh you know the footprints of, of modern bathrooms, but in terms of how the plumbing and uh, the structures would have changed as it accommodated modern plumbing as well. Um, and I'm just going to take a pause here and put a, a shout out <laughs> um, to all of our participants. Uh, if you have additional materials about the families that lived here, uh, we know and we're just briefly in touch with Warren. And I think you're in the audience tonight, Warren. So if you do want to say something, uh, let me know and I'll try to uh, elevate you to panelists so you can pop in here and say just a few words. Uh, but for example, we know that in uh, one side of the duplex uh, that former Mayor Joe Robeson uh, was born. And it's actually kind of a touching story is that uh, he was born in the winter months and uh, he wasn't actually expected to survive. Uh, so the family had to rush through the woods, had to rush through the fields, the back of the house uh, to the Catholic church just uh, in the next block over. Uh, to baptize uh, the little baby uh, who, again, wonderfully survived uh, and, you know, did a wonderful service uh, to not only Laurel uh, community, uh, but for the museum as well. He's a huge proponent of uh, the Laurel Historical Society and getting its museum building. Uh, and sadly, he did pass away a couple years ago, um, but we know uh, some oral history. So I was kind of having in the back of my mind is like, hmm, did uh, his, you know, brothers or sisters or uh, some neighbors uh, play with some of the toys that we were finding uh, in the artifact. So I uh, just want to say thank you to Warren for providing this picture. I know you have others uh, and we would be um, Yep, so Warren, thank you so much for popping into the chat. So Warren's got more pictures, uh, the uh, carriage building between the duplexes. So Mary, we're going to have to uh, meet up with Warren yes. one of these days. Uh, Absolutely. See that Maybe we can answer some of these strange questions. I think so. You know, I love my maps. I love the archaeology, you know, is, is where my heart lies. But you know, sometimes, you know, pictures just do it and, and, and look at his family. Reads, you know, you see the details on the front porch. Uh, and to some of that architecture as well. So thank you for providing that picture. Uh, and I encourage you, uh, anyone else, if you have pictures or stories or maps or anything like that uh, related to our project area, please get in touch with me. Or other areas of Laurel that you Or other areas of Laurel, yeah, exactly. <laughs> thank you. Like, why limit that? If you've got anything about Laurel, you just share with me. Uh, we will be glad to take your stories and uh, information and, uh, you know, just, just put that out there. That, that's what we do uh, at the Laurel Historical Society. Uh, so I just wanted to now segue. I know we're getting a little um, closer to the end of our time tonight, but this is really kind of our site map. So I, I took the base map of uh, from the GIS system and kind of um, plotted approximate locations of where we dug either test pits uh, or test units. So those are the, the squares with the blue and the uh, round 
holes called shovel test pits. And the little star marks not the Laurel Museum this time, but our data point. So that was uh, a very conveniently located fence post <laughs> in the back of the yard uh, that served as our data point. Uh, and so from there, we, we did a grid to lay in the test units and uh, the shovel test pits from there. So you can see the frame building, uh, the big rectangles, the duplex, uh, you can see that there's some sidewalks uh, in the backyard. Uh, and then the grayish area is really a weird mix of gravel, asphalt, parking. Um, Pilates buses were parked on it for most of the time we were there. Uh, they have a storage building, a storage shed, uh, and a lacrosse pit uh, right there before you get into their football practice field. So that's kind of what we're looking at. And as you can see, we did not uh, do a whole big grid over the property. Once we started working with the students and looked at the artifacts that we were getting, um, we quickly realized that we were getting some great materials, but where we really wanted to dig, you know, as archaeologists, we want those outbuildings, the trash pits, the back of the property, the privies, they were under the parking lots and <laughs> under the gravel and we just could not break through to to get them so um unfortunately we could not access them the whole time the demolition was going and even prior to the demolition so uh they remain safe and sound uh under the construction area for now and soon to be parking lots in the future so uh hopefully if it uh, turns out in the future, archaeologists will be able to find out more about the, the people that lived in the houses by the use of um, different technology to, to access them. But uh, so this is the this is what we are looking at with our uh, excavations. Uh, so yeah, I'll just kind of go through our timeline and then uh, introduce some of our help and then uh, I'll pass it over to Mary to talk about some of the artifacts uh, that we were working with. Uh, so this is what I'm calling the backyard of the two properties. You can see the back of the white building had some weird wooden deck thing <laughs> on it. And then the back of the yellow, um, the wooden frame is the enclosed back porch for the duplex. And so this was summer 2021. This was our first summer camp. Uh, so we had some great helpers uh, for uh, our summer camp uh, parents. Uh, we also had one of our board members and Laurel Elementary School teacher, Amy Dunham, uh, in the middle there in blue. Uh, she was very instrumental in, in helping us to get the camp up and running for when we returned on site. And so you can see the pin flag, some of the equipment of the archaeology. Uh, you can you know see where we were starting to find artifacts on the surface. That's what the kids are doing there, just kind of seeing what modern trash or historical artifacts might be present uh, and noting them so we can put them on the map. But I do want to call your attention again to what's underneath that blue cart. That is the <laughs> mixed gravel asphalt rock parking pad and we tried to get a test unit in the back there as close to the original property line and uh, privies outbuildings on those maps as we could and we just could not get down and I felt uh, sorry for the campers that were struggling for the first couple of days with that units uh, before we moved them to a half unit closer to the White House so that's why we had three test units uh, among two or three campers each. Uh, and then when we called the first test units, we did a uh, half size. So one and a half feet by one and a half feet uh, in the corner of the white building um, by, by that tree. So that's kind of our overview of the project area. Uh, and then Mary went through and, and did a brief artifact analysis, uh, looking at th through the artifact bags that we found. Uh, and so it's really kind of typical uh, domestic deposit, you know, from the late 1800s. Uh, mostly through to the 1950s, and then your modern modern trash. So we'll get into some pretty artifact pictures in a little bit, uh, but you can kind of see there's you know typical um, you know architectural elements like mortar and brick and you know linoleum, window glass. Um, but we do get uh, some clues as to kitchen objects or utilitarian pieces. Uh, as well as um, lots of children's toys, which you'll, you'll see in just a few minutes as well. Um, so Mary, did also, you want to point Those are not alien here? references with the UFO. That's an unidentified ferrous object. We jokingly used to call them UFOs on site. So 
that sort of it's it, it's a chunk of metal. We don't know what it is because it's all rusty now. Yeah, so we we found a, a lot of that. Um, yes. <laughs> not unusual um, on demolition sites. Yeah, it, exactly. I mean, sites, but, you know, so. they could have been burned. Maryland the soil, you know, is you know fairly um, acidic too, so I don't just kind of eat away at, at that. So, uh, so we this was kind of our, our first go at the artifact analysis. We hope to do more with our students, particularly the archaeology club students coming up. Uh, but the next time we returned to the site was our Public Archaeology Day uh, just a few months later in October of 21. And this was a really great response because we were able to involve um, some younger children, again, as you see in the pictures, uh, also members of the public, people that were living in Laurel and had heard of our project or knew about the pending demolition and wanted to be part of the action. So you can see this is uh, both pictures from that weird wooden porch patio deck thing on the single family house. Uh, and so this is where we first started digging those round uh, holes, which are called the shovel test pits. Uh, and so we wanted to concentrate as much as we could close to uh, the the um, backyard, the patio area, trying to get into maybe that there were some more activity areas closer to the back door and to the back porch. Uh, and so you can see that the family there in the left picture, they are completing the half unit that the summer camp uh, students started. And it was good that they did because we actually found uh, part of a China doll head coming out of that uh, unit there. So again, kind of in the back, the play area, you can just imagine and just generations of children playing in this yard. Uh, and then in the picture to the right, you can see that there's some, um, some members excavating between the two houses. So our third test unit was kind of placed deliberately in between the two houses to see if we could maybe get uh, a fence line, if there had been a fence separating the property at uh, any time in the past. Uh, or if there was some sort of, you know, kitchen debris area, if there's a trash pit, you know, because we can see the modern addition, we know from the historic maps that there was some sort of uh, back addition as well in the early 1900s. So we were hoping to capture um, a lot of information. Uh, and we did because that is the, the unit where we got the most artifacts from. Uh, and again, this is just kind of an overview of our project area. You can see with the orange or pink pin flags, uh, part of our grid of STPs. So kind of going along the baseline uh, out from our datum points uh, across the back property to the lacrosse pit uh, and then paralleling uh, the modern chain link, chain link fence um, in between uh, the two structures. And so you can see the, the blue tarp covering test unit three. So you can see it's approximately like what, 12 or 15 feet uh, in between the houses, and that would have been uh, the same on the other side for the second duplex. Uh, and again, not a ton of surprises, nothing, uh, you know, super different uh, from the shovel test pits that we were getting from the test units. Uh, the soil profiles were, were predictable. There wasn't, you know, um, any super interesting activities <laughs> like well, we'll talk about in just a few minutes uh, and I realize I have to, to speed up here but it's um, it's still very interesting uh, to see uh, the consistency that was coming out of this. Uh, and then our last summer camp was last year and so we moved away from the backyards because we kind of gleaned all the information we could, and we were kind of crowded in with our gravel area. Uh, and so we moved into the vacant lot, which we knew was the site of a, a second duplex. Uh, and so we kind of Basically, we let the kids pick what they wanted to dig, um, and we Mary uh, made sure that they moved into the shade, which uh, turned out to be really good because again, it, it's August, so uh, it, it was quite warm. But it was good. Yeah, go ahead. Were you going to say anything, Mary? Mm, no. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So it was good. Uh, you know, we we got some consistency, and we got a little um, early indication of what demolition would look like for the houses because uh, we were kind of our, our one of our test units was really smack dab in the basement area uh, of the duplex and so we got kind of a, a preview of kind of the mix uh, of demolition uh, debris uh, that we would get when demolition actually started. Uh, 
Uh, and so these are some of the, the pictures again, you know, kind of, um, you know, very typical Maryland uh, soil. We did have a rainy day, as you can see in one of the pictures. Uh, and then I forget if that's a feature. I don't think we found a feature. I, I think at one point we were working with um, the high school students and we were just trying to, to chunk out um, into the subsoil and into one of our units to show the students that technique. Uh, and then finally, uh, I'm really happy to announce that from October uh, to present, we just had a session with the club students uh, earlier this afternoon. Mary and I were over uh, in Mr. Bill Bailey's uh, classroom. Uh, so, so far it's 27 sessions that these kids have put in either excavating in the backyards uh, or that the side project or uh, working in the classroom to wash artifacts, process artifacts, look at maps, talk about what life was like in Laurel uh, for these uh, tenant houses, uh, the people that lived in the tenant houses. Uh, and so I do want to um, say a special thanks to uh, Isabel Ryan, who was a teacher uh, last year at Pilates, uh, and Mr. Bill Bailey, who's a social studies teacher uh, at Pilates. And he's been doing a lot of work to keep the students uh, in check and engaged with our club. So it's been really fantastic to start the club, keep them engaged, uh, and then we have um, one field trip planned as well. They're going to be uh, going out um, to Howard County to the West Friendship uh, Tenant Farming Site, uh, which is another um, site uh, from Howard County, Braxton Park, uh, and Kelly Palich was one of our uh, speakers for the club sessions as well, and she's uh, going to treat the students to a field trip there in a couple weeks. All right, so I'm going to blast through the demolition process and again, kind of to use the <laughs> instead of going, going, gone, this is how it started. We had the, the frame house, we had the duplex, we had the art building in the very back. You can see some preliminary um, work. They were trying, I think, to save some of the cornices, I, I think, um, to put it into the addition that they were planning. And then the frame house was the first to go. <laughs> so they started with the frame house first, and that was gone here on the left. Uh, then they went to the storage building behind it, uh, which is the lacrosse field. They went to the art building next, and then they finally went to the brick duplex. Um, so you can start to see some of the uh, Pilates building in the background. Uh, and then finally, that's all that remains. And you'll see a very uh, similar site when you go today, although they are moving a lot more of the, the infrastructure of the, the um, addition into place now. So uh, this is looking from 9th Street uh, toward 8th Street uh, with the Pilates High School in the middle. So it's all been leveled, it's all been graded. Uh, so the trees, the sidewalks, everything is gone. And like I said, anything that was buried under the surface that we didn't get to uh, is really uh, intact. They were not really digging into the ground to kind of level anything at this point. So uh, everything has been added on top of it. Uh, and then here are some demolition pictures. I'm going to let you look at those until I take a sip of water. Uh, but Mary, I'm going to put this out to you, uh, especially if you wanted to talk about some of the uh, surprises that came out of the construction of the duplex. The One of the things that was interesting, the brick structures, actually two brick thick, and you can't really see it on here, but the bricks were laid in a very unusual pattern. And considering they were tenant properties it was very interesting to me that someone would have gone through that much effort to put quite a beautiful design into the brick so that was a surprise I really wanted to get into the basements better but somewhere along the line uh, during renovation they blocked off some of the basement area uh, what we could get into was a little treacherous but it was it, it, it just whetted the appetite for wanting to find out more. We were very confused. We fact, were, a lot of, yeah, and we were confused. And that was <laughs> really just one of the first of many questions that kind of came yes. out. Yes. <laughs> I, um, I, I think these buildings actually created more questions by the time they fell down than what we had starting out, which is not normal for an archaeological site. 
Not, not really. We were hoping, again, the demolition would help to answer some questions about how it was built and what it was built on and, uh, you know, maybe some surprises in, in uh, the mix. Uh, we got very few artifacts out of the demolition. There were just a few things that were kind of knocked about as they were kind of grading or ripping out the trees, you know, some of the substructure, you know, so we got some things out of it, but we didn't really get any stuff out of the demolition. Um, but we got, uh, in addition to some of these questions as to why they would make such a kind of a special design out of essentially a rental property. Um, the other kind of question that kind of came about was, uh, so initially we thought that the frame house was what, 1920, and then we thought it was 1900 according to the inventory survey. And then on the maps, it's clearly there in 1897. So it's gotta be at least that old, if not a decade or so earlier uh, from the architecture. And um then we were told that uh, that house possibly burned uh, sometime, what, in the 1930s, 1950s? Yeah, uh, I think they said 30s. In the 30s. And so that could possibly answer some of the questions that we saw when it was being demolished because we we saw some modern uh kind of architectural elements we yeah. saw some rebar things that you would not expect in a house built in the 1890s but what we didn't find archaeologically or during the demolition was really any evidence of a large-scale fire uh, you know so if we thought if there if the property had burned in part we were right there next to the porch we were right there uh, in the shovel test pits, we would have seen some sort of ash layer or just some uh, debris. Uh, yeah, you there know, was be, nothing. There was just nothing. Just, you know, so uh, so we got to kind of go back to the records, go back, uh, talk to people who lived in the area during that time, uh, even kind of dig into the newspapers to see if there was any evidence of a fire uh, and just kind of see if we can try to try to get a few more answers uh, uh, out of these uh, long list of questions that, that we have now. Uh, but we do have some artifacts, uh, some pretty things to look at as well as hopefully give us some more uh, answers. But uh, in all of those little spreadsheets that you looked at, we don't have a ton of diagnostic artifacts. And by that, we mean uh, artifacts that can really be pinpointed to a specific time range. Like for the ceramic, for example, they were manufactured between uh, you know, one date and another. And then so that kind of gives us a time range where we can say, OK, well, if we found this on the site, most likely it was made and used uh, during the, the time frame on uh, which it was manufactured. or or really any time later. Uh, and so really the only one we have to go on at this point is the one that you just uh, researched, Mary, mm -hmm. uh, if you wanted to, to say a few words about that. Um, I, I just tracked this down. I have not been able to pinpoint the date clearly, but it is a Royal Patton Ironstone and it's Prince of Wales. That's missing from the top of the crest. It actually does say Prince of Wales, Royal Patton uh, Ironstone and Burgess and Goddard, which is interesting because when they sold them in England, it was um, Goddard and Burgess. But for some reason, when they brought them over here, Burgess got top billing. <laughs> but <laughs> well, it is so definitely um, 1800s. Uh, again, I, I can't really break it down any tighter because I'm still trying to identify this particular design and mm -hmm. I'm having trouble. The one in the middle with the lovely violets has me intrigued. We actually have seven pieces to this cup. And what looks like on the bottom, a, a little, almost like a Japanese character or something. And I cannot find this, ref, you know, in any reference book or online at all. So if anybody has any ideas, please scream. <laughs> I, I would love to know because I love this little cup. Yeah, it really is a sweet piece. Uh, and one of the few, like I said, that give any yeah. type of clue, uh, most of it is just plain whiteware, uh, no decoration. So the, the pieces that you do see on the screen here today uh, really are, are going to represent what where we continue our research into and to kind of just pinpoint uh, the types of pottery that they were, uh, that they had. Again, that we're going to 
talk about, you know, their consumerism and what level of, um, you know, participating in the economy that renters and tenant um, houses and families could participate in. Um, the picture on the right is, is funny because we get to see, you know, a fairly, you know, nice piece of um, blue edged, uh, probably white wear, but then it's right next to a yellow plastic dinosaur. <laughs> if you can make that out. Oh, so. yeah, I, I didn't even notice it was there, but I see it. And uh, so this was our final project. This I mentioned our session with the Archaeology Club students uh, at Pilates earlier this afternoon. Uh, and so this is one of the things that they helped us with today, uh, taking some artifact pictures. So just you can see just the huge range uh, of items that we have. We found, not surprisingly, a, a lot of children's toys ranging from clay and glass marbles all the way up to little plastic diver helmets to the plastic dinosaur. Uh, a cow, we have like something we swear is a little plastic um, hatchet, um, all the way to things that probably fell out of students' backpacks at the high school maybe five or six years ago. We have a, a comb or a brush and a mechanical pencil. Uh, we did find one coin, I think it's a wheat penny from the 1940s, uh, but nothing. 1919. Uh, oh, 1919. Oh, good. We found out. Good. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, so that's, you know, so that's pretty significant as well. Uh, other than a ton of oyster shells, we didn't really find any or many uh, bones, any indication of what they were eating. Uh, so that, again, probably would have been in like the trash pit, the backyard area where we weren't uh, able to access uh, with our investigations. Um, but we did have some some surprise come out of it. And Mary, you got some help diagnosing this one. Yeah, we found two little tusks and my husband was very helpful in telling me they were from pigs, or at least that he thinks they're from pigs. Um, but the, the assemblage itself is not anything unusual for the time period and for the class of people living there. So we didn't really have anything stand out. Um, I was kind of hoping we would but it, it, it all was pretty expected, mm -hmm. except for the little pickaxe. I kind of like that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, some of the, the children's <laughs> toys were really fun. Uh, but yeah, like Mary said, it's just typical, you know, kind of working class, middle class, nothing yeah. super high end, nothing super coarse, utilitarian. Uh, so, you know, one of our next steps uh, will be to continue the archival research and to continue to work with the students. Uh, they wanted to incorporate some of the artifacts that they had found into a display when the new facility is completed. So I think that'll be uh, a great way not only to talk about the process of archaeology, but to, you know, honor the story of the families that lived in those houses that are, are no longer and to make that connection, you know, from past and present uh, with the students. Uh, in the school today and the children that you know, used to grow up there. Uh, so we're going to finish the artifact analysis, do a, a little better job, you know, pinpointing some of the, the dates for that. And we're just going to keep an eye out on the construction process, make sure we document that as much as possible before submitting a final report to the high school uh, administration. Um, and uh, eventually to, uh, to the state of Maryland as well. So I just want to say uh, thank you uh, to uh, the principal and assistant principal over at Pilates, uh, Bill Bailey, like I mentioned, uh, the social studies teacher, our um, uh, Mary and Amy uh, and Isabel, another teacher, all the club students, all the summer camp students, uh, and Kelly Palich for, um, uh, in, in, I guess, uh, pre-thank you for, for taking the kids on a field trip uh, in a couple weeks. So uh, that's kind of our uh, presentation tonight. So this was uh, what we wanted to update you on, give you an idea of the range of an archaeological investigation, not just talking about what comes out of the ground, but uh, everything that goes goes along with that, talking to people that used to live there, looking at photographs and maps uh, and archival documents. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen, but uh, I know we're a few minutes over eight o'clock, but if you have any questions, please put them into the Q&A and chat, uh, and we'll do our best to answer them.
Um, and uh, again, you know, if you are interested in archaeology or interested in laurel archaeology specifically, uh, then get involved. So if you go to MarylandArchaeology.org, uh, you'll find um, different opportunities to get involved with archaeology in Maryland. Uh, the closest one to us is probably the Upper Patuxent Archaeology Group that's run by our friend Kelly. Uh, I'm a life member of the Archaeological Society of Northern Chesapeake. Um, and so there's really a lot of chapters, no matter where you live in Maryland, that you can get involved uh, with archaeology. And if you want to stick to your roots and, and uh, get involved with what's happening at the Laurel Historical Society uh, for this project in particular, uh, you know, helping Mary with some of the deed and archival research, um, you can uh, get in touch with us as well. So I'm going to take a quick peek into the Q&A and the chat, Mary, and I might throw out a couple of things to see if you can uh, help answer them. Um, well, I so did one... uh, answer the one. Someone asked whether or not the penny was a nickel penny, and I said no, it was a standard copper wheat. So I did answer that one already. Okay, perfect. Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah, I just saw that when we were photographing it today with the students. So that was exciting because I had totally forgotten we actually had a coin, which is uh, exciting. Actually, so. we had two. The other one, I think, was something from the 1970s. Okay. I, I, yeah. I don't remember, but I think that was another penny. Um, and so uh, you did some of the research. There's a question in the Q&A that says, do the houses show up on the 1900 census? Were you able to get back that far yet? Um, the 1900 census has housing or house let's put it this way there are people listed as living on ninth street but they do not have addresses so i can't put a particular person in a particular house um until 1930 i was able to do the 30 40 and 50 and put actual names to the properties the really odd thing as small as these duplexes were Sometime between 1940 and 1950, the uh, building that has since been or was torn down at the time, uh, the 226-228, had actually been turned into six apartments. And I mean, these things must have been tiny to get six apartments. I, they, they must have been living like in one or two rooms at most. And there was only one bathroom in that in each side of the duplex. So I'm not really sure how they were uh, divvying up the space. Yeah, Warren uh, might have a better answer on that. Uh, but yeah, there, there's just mysteries to it. And, you know, it's yeah. it is kind of heartbreaking when, you know, when you're standing in front of these houses and you are watching them fall down, you know, it's heartbreaking to think of how many generations of families and kids grew up there. And that's why it was so important for us to, to document it, but also more importantly, to, to make that connection with this generation of students and children and, and kind of share that love and appreciation of, of our local history. So uh, it, it was, you know, kind of, you know, bittersweet project, but, you know, we, we got a lot of good stuff come out of it. Um, and Jeannie asked, what years did the Robeson family live in the duplex? I was just checking that. Um, <laughs> I believe they were there uh, there was a Walter and Mildred Robinson living in 222 on the 1930 census. Yes, because I believe Joe was born sometime in the 30s. I want to say, I, I shouldn't say, but yeah, he was born in the 30s. And uh, so I think he had older siblings at that point, but I don't believe that they stayed there very long because um, I was talking, you know, talking to his daughter, Mitzi, uh, a little bit. But yeah, we don't have a great um great timeline for that as well so that'll be the other thing we'll uh add to add to our list but yeah, yeah it's a, in the, we in still the have research, that connection in the research going back um i hit a bit of a brick wall because the Schaffer family owned the property and he passed it on in 1914 um through a will and in that will, it does not list an earlier deed. So when you're doing a deed chain, it always mentions the deed before the current deed. And with a will, you kind of lose that chain. And unfortunately, I would just go back and look at everything he owned and find the one that's the right property. However, the man owned most of Laurel. So I, that's going to take me a little more time to get any of the deed research 
prior to 1913 will to, to maybe answer some of the questions on when these buildings were built. But yeah, he had everything the, from the railroad station all the way up to yeah. Main Street. This, this is the only archaeological site I, I think I've ever worked on in my life where I came out with more questions than I went in with. And it's going to haunt me until I figure them out. Yeah, but that that's a great thing, you know. So, you know, as you're listening to this and thinking like, oh, how do they make sense of this? You know, sometimes the, the answer is we we don't or we don't have enough to, to kind of fully answer those questions. So uh, there's so much, you know, deed research, looking at the census, talking to descendants of people that lived in the houses, looking at pictures and, and trying to put it all together. Uh, so it, it's it's been challenging, but it's been fun too. And, and so everything we learned is, is going into a report that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger and will continue to grow. But again, that's why it's so important to us to, to even start this project in, in the first place, because there is just so much history and like I said, you know, with the families that live there, it's so very important to bring those stories to life. But it's part of that bigger story just in that one historic block that talks about the early mill history, that talks about the the um, the history of the Catholic Church, that talks about uh, the, the tenants and the laborers. Uh, so there is there's just so much uh, to learn and then to continue to learn. So. Um, okay, so this is our information. Um, and yeah, I just encourage you to, to keep in touch with us again. We're always looking for volunteers. So if you want to help us out with this project, let us know. And please, just as a reminder, come and look at the museum. We have a great exhibit of exploring all the different areas of Laurel. And um, I think that's it. So I'm going to stop my screen and I'm going to stop the recording, but I will stay on for a few more minutes just in case anyone has any questions. But again, thank you for joining us, Mary. Thank you so much for your help, not only tonight, but uh, for the past couple of years as well uh, with the kids. And um, thank you. And uh, we'll see you around Laurel very soon.